My Nightmare on Elm Street tie-in is about a female group of female geek girls who initiate a Columbine-like attack on their school. But uh, rather than using a bomb, they decide that they're going to use Freddy as a weapon to get revenge against uh, the popular girls who are mean to them. Okay, well, the Dream Dealers, it takes place a couple of years in the future. And there's this new technology, it's something called the Trance Box. And it's a device that can record memories and play them back so that other people can experience them as if they're their own experiences. But not only does it record memories, it also can record dreams. So with, with the Dream Warriors as a kind of faux superhero team within the dream world, I took each of their deaths and expanded upon that to say, well, this is how they might have developed past there. Uh, my novel, Suffolk Children, was definitely inspired by the third Elm Street film, uh, Dream Warriors. The idea of the, uh, the group of teenagers, they get some sort of powers or abilities, uh, and they have to use these to fight against Freddy. I mean, that's, there are clear correlations between Suffolk Children and Dream Warriors. But there are other elements in the mix as well. I mean, there's a little bit of Stephen King's Firestarter in there with the whole drug experimentation angle that, that kicks off my story. And the other thing that really inspired it, in a kind of bizarre way, actually, is the film The Breakfast Club, which came out around the same time as the first Elm Street film. Uh, in my head, weirdly, Suffer the Children is like the satanic mashup of Elm Street and Breakfast Club, and then the two collide. When you look around horror, if you're going to get a capable hero, who is there to get that's of equal iconic stature, at least maybe not to the masses, but to the core? And in that case, there's one guy, and that was Ash. And so we, we went into that. Uh, the movie comes out, does very nice box office performance. We start trying to get into negotiations. Uh, Sam and the camp are very interested. We negotiate sort of on and off over two years, as is the nature of Hollywood deal making. It comes and it goes, and we try again, and it comes and it goes, until ultimately the deal's just not going to make. Freddy versus Jason versus Ash, to me, was I, the way I always saw it was never so much as a sequel. I almost kind of saw it as my personal trilogy. You know, you had Freddy versus Jason, you had Freddy versus Jason versus Ash, which kind of bringing Ash into it kind of end capped a lot of the bookends on on that Freddy Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th storyline, and then bringing the Nightmare Warriors was a way to then bring those victims and to, to perfectly bookend all of them. The first draft I ever read was the Peter Briggs draft, which was actually taking very good care of continuity to where uh, Alice the Dream Master was in it, the Freemans from Jason Go to Hell uh, were in it, and ultimately it was about these the kids and the families coming together ultimately to stop them. The best ending I read in any of which I actually still think was in the Briggs draft, and in fact, because by the time this comes out I can say it, it's we ripped it off and we use it as an uh, homage, if you will, at the end of the Freddy Jason Ash Nightmare Warriors comic, where one of your federal agents in the sort of final battle is sucked through a time vortex and ends up back in Springwood in the desk uh, it, with the uh, search warrant to go get Fred Krueger in front of him, forges the signature and undoes basically the entire reign of terror. I definitely was a fan of the original movie and uh, of the slasher type, uh, you can't really, anti-hero I guess is the right word. And it just seemed like a great opportunity to get a chance to you know, run loose in someone else's playground and have fun with someone else's characters. I, I write horror books and uh, how can you not be familiar and how can you not be a fan? I liked all the movies. I mean, uh, the first one, you know, seemed, it was so fresh and different. Uh, never seen anything quite like that before. By 1990, Freddy Krueger was at the peak of his popularity in pop culture. And Dave Imhoff was now in charge of licensing at New Line Cinema. And he saw that comic books really had the potential to help expand the Freddy Krueger mythos without requiring actors and, and long gestation periods and things like that. So he was very receptive to the idea when I came to him and said, I'd like to really try and, and get another publisher interested in Nightmare on Elm Street as a comic series. At the same time, I approached Innovation Publishing, which was a color comic book company that was doing some licensed books, but not a lot. And Innovation said, well, if you can get us the license, we think we might work with them. I got them the license. Dave Imhoff was a gem of a person to work with. And the Nightmare on Elm Street comic was born. Now done the Freddy vs. Jason movie, the first Freddy Jason Ash comic, which is just a, a uh, adaptation of the treatment we did, and now the new Freddy Jason Ash Nightmare Warriors, which is basically, as I said, bringing back all the survivors and kind of giving them one last final ride, including some surprises, I think, cameo-wise that will make people happy that are longtime Nightmare fans. 
for me personally, uh, it's a thrill because I got at a certain level, speaking selfishly, uh, a way to get to do sort of a personal trilogy. Friday the 13th would be, and, and Nightmare on Elm Street would be more of a visceral, gritty look. And so I was immediately torn between how to do this artistically because Ash had always been kind of caricaturized in the books, drawing Ash in a, almost making him looking like a living caricature from a real, more realistic point of view, just kind of caricaturizing some of his features. And the rest of that, I really tried to keep it in the same vein as, as Freddy vs. Jason, you know, to make it look like a legitimate sequel. I think that part of the reason why the franchise has such legs and why so many people novelize it or spin it off into other forms, comics, etc., is because the character is based on dreams, and dreams are infinite. So any different people have different dreams. They have different things happening in their minds. The possibilities are infinite. How do you keep the adult tone of the, of the movies and, and the jokey aspects of Freddy Krueger while not dwelling on the fact that he's a child killer. Black Flame specifically asked their writers to not include any child murder in any of the Freddy novels, which I found odd, considering that that sort of is his, that's his whole thing, and uh, no molestation either. Although, I mean, I do, I refer to it. You can't sanitize Freddy. He is a child killer and a child molester. And that, that is who the character is, and that's part of what makes him so terrifying. And if you smooth off those rough edges to make him more family friendly, then why have him at all? Why not have Barney? That's my nightmare. So in my first couple of stories, it was revealed that Nancy is still alive in the beautiful dream. She's essentially the polar opposite of Freddy. If Freddy represented nightmares, and all that was evil and all that could harm you in dreams, Nancy represented all the things that were good and all the things that you could hope for to have in a dream. She, was, she actually became the protector within the dream world. And thus, it gave it an aspect of the two of them pitted against each other would give us uh, a struggle that I thought the fans would really enjoy. And in fact, they loved it. I like the, uh, the, the third film, Dream Warriors. I, I you know, uh, took a lot from that where the, the, the victims, rather than simply being victims, are, are far more proactive. Um, they're banding together and, and using their abilities to try to manipulate their dream selves to, to make them, um, you know, a little bit more of a challenge for Freddy. The feedback was remarkably positive, actually, um, which was gratifying, because I'm an Elm Street fan myself, and I read several of the other novels that were published. And it was important to me that people who love the films and have watched the films for the past quarter of a century uh, liked what I did. There were some people for whom it wasn't their kind of Elm Street story, and I absolutely understand that. You know, It's subjective. What people expect of this sort of story uh, is going to vary. But most of the feedback I had was really positive. It's been one of my most popular books, actually. As PR was ramping up for Freddy's Dead the Final Nightmare, I actually did an appearance with Lisa Zane at a comic convention in California. And at that, we did a mock funeral for Freddy Krueger. Well, New Line liked the idea so much that they actually decided that they were going to do their own mock funeral. So after the movie came out on October 31st, 1991, they held a funeral for Freddy Krueger at the Hollywood Cemetery. And they invited the stars of the films, uh, they invited the press. E, e Television filmed it and did a story on it that night. It was my first national news story. They interviewed me and so forth. So it was amazing to see the comic books get that kind of res respect from a film company. Typically, combine elements of science fiction uh, and horror in my in my work. I also wanted to do something a little almost like, what if David Cronenberg were to direct a, a Nightmare on Elm Street story? What would that be like? You know. And so there was a little kind of a Cronenberg kind of element in the back of my mind here, you know, back to classic stuff like Videodrome and, and um, Scanners, you know, so I wanted to, a little, you know, it's a subtle science fiction element, but it's essential to the plot. When I started to write this novel, I thought I'd better watch the original movie again to just reacquaint myself with the series and, you know, sort of kickstart my own imagination. And uh, as I was watching the film, I saw a lot of Southern California familiar sights, you know, Southern California license plates, palm trees, 
familiar locations. And so I naturally assumed that the town where that movie takes place was here in Southern California. Also, one of the characters uh, in the original movie makes a reference to earthquake weather, or that things get really strange before an earthquake. And I don't think there are that many earthquakes in Ohio. Uh, yet, uh, many of the fans felt that I had violated their beloved franchise by setting it in Southern California, when in fact, Springwood was later uh, set in Ohio. Uh, I didn't realize that at the time, but I guess, after all, I was right. I thought it would be a great idea to have some shots of Robert having, you know, raked his claws across my chest and ripped my clothes up and so forth. Now, this is in 1990. In 1990, body piercings were not tremendously well known. I have a nipple ring. Not a big shock today. Back in 1990, when I took my shirt off, there was audible gasps from about 30 big burly crew members. Oh my God, what the hell's that? What, what did you do? They were freaked out. Robert took it all in stride. He thought it was kind of cool. And the final issue of Freddy's Dead the Final Nightmare, we were going to publish the shot of him with me with the ripped shirt. And then somebody at the comic company said, you know, your nipple ring's visible. I don't know if we can publish that. And I said, in a book on a child about a child killer with murder and blood and so forth, you aren't sure you can publish a nipple ring. Yeah, that might be a little too much. They had a meeting. The board of directors of Innovation Comics had a meeting over whether or not they could publish a picture with the included in my nipple ring. Their decision, if New Line approves it, will allow it. So they went to New Line, who had a meeting about whether or not they would allow a comic book to be published with a picture of somebody with their nipple ring visible. New Line approved it, Innovation approved it. When it was published, it's about that big, and my nipple ring is about the size of, you know, like a spot from a pencil. You have to actually look to see what it is. You know, it's interesting. Fandom is an interesting phenomenon, you know, that people become so obsessed with a property that they almost feel an ownership. They feel like they, they know more than the creators, that they almost, through their love and obsession with this idea or concept, it's like it becomes theirs. You know, and that's, I mean, we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have novelization or tie-ins if it wasn't for the fans because obviously they want more. They want to know what happens next and then what happens. So, you know, that's what keeps guys like me in business. Freddy versus Jason versus Ash works because what people don't realize is those three characters have been intertwined for a very long time. All the other horror characters really belong in their own universe. And I really don't see them overlapping at no point in history has any studio supported a comic book as much as New Line Cinema supported this comic. So I felt it was my duty as the writer of the comic to make sure that it was the absolute best Freddy Krueger comic ever done. It was a very recognized series. Um, we, try, we all worked very hard to make it the closest thing to a cinematic experience as it could be. Elm Street stories are about the empowerment of teenagers. They're they're coming of age stories, they're rites of passage. You look at any of the films and most of the books, it's adults in those stories, they're absent or they're powerless or impotent. It's up to the teenage characters uh, to stand up to Freddy, to stand up to evil, and to learn to stand on their own two feet. If there's any lesson to be learned from Nightmare on Elm Street, it is that if you take control of your life, if you have faith in yourself and, and you, you have the will, that you can change things. Uh, because we see so many characters who have the ability within Freddy's world to change their circumstances in order to survive. Freddy's had a great life in cinema, in books, and in comics, and I'm so glad to have been a part of that. I think if the world can live on, even in comics in the classic continuity where Jacob Johnson and, and the rest of these characters uh, can go off and continue to play and do their thing, it kind of keeps the, the spirit alive in a lot of fun ways. And, and I, I've been consistently thrilled with the fan response, and I do a lot of comic signings, and. Uh, They've been incredibly enthusiastic. And again, I just think it comes from the fact that those of us that are hardcore fans of any of these franchises, all you want is a little respect for continuity. And if you get that, you're really happy. It doesn't take a lot. I just need a tickle, that's all. And usually people will be pretty happy.